The title of this message is Breakthrough Comes on the Wings of Praise. Shakalabasata. Scriptural references is Psalm 147 through Psalm 150. And also from my, my great book, Prophetic Keys to Successful Living, uh, I, I'm going to bring from praise, prayer, progress, and promotion. And funny enough, they all go together. And then prophecy, but prophecy is another, is a totally different uh, species of its own kind in reality. Provision is another one. Relationships are important. Because through, and, and that's all from the book here. R relationships are the conduit to getting anything you want in life. You from people, people from you, through people, through you, all together, all mixed up. The realm of relationship does something. I'll just say that in passing here. Uh, but you have to have the proper, proper relationships. Just like in your mindset, I wrote this before that in the realm of quality, quality, Q, there's P and then Q and then R in the alphabet because this is an A to Z. If you don't have this book, you need to get it. And... Uh, published and forwarded by the great Archbishop Harrison Nanga, who loves me so much and I love him. The power of relationship there is, is something. Quality relationships are important. You could have relationships with a lot of people, but you may not get a lot out of it. But if you have quality with high-level people, everything about them is, has a high-level quality to it, so you're going to extract something from that. So who you relate with is extraordinarily important. Again, the title of this is Breakthrough Comes on the Wings of Praise. Oh my. Let me get into it. By the beloved Thomas Matthew IV. Quality is important in life. Even opulence and elegance is, is comes from a mindset. Do you know you can have cash, but you don't have the right mindset and you don't know what to do with it? Business comes from having a proper mindset. This guy who is really clowning around with the world now, but he's just very successful in business. He wrote this principle about business going at the speed of thought through technology. Important. Speed is important. Quickness is important. But again, your environment, your relationships, and the level of praise in a situation to God. See, we think praise is just a worthy word for God, but it's more than that. Now, I'm going to get into this a bit. I'm going to get to the scriptures in a moment, but I want to say a few things. The, the, the realm of praise works in the realm of your praise to God exalts him ex Extol is a funny word. You know, it's an old kind of English word. I don't know what it means, really. Extol, exalt. Exalt means to lift up. I mean, that's kind of easier to figure out than extol. E-X-T-O-L. Anyway, to, to lift him up and laud him, L-A-U-D, in a realm of applaud. That's where we get the word applause from. Applaud him in a realm of putting him in that high place. Now... His, <laughs> oh Lord, thank you for your anointing, oh my, right now. The, the realm of applause gives him a realm of appreciation, not that God needs anything from us, because he's already there. Believe you me, he's already there. He even said in scripture, if I needed anything, what I'd tell you, you know. So it's not that he needs anything. The successful person also doesn't really need things per se. What they need is to be more productive. And that comes to, to the realm of praise. Praise is not just something we do for God. It's also something we do in the realm of 
relationships and environments, you know, and principles. Like you can praise a certain principle by living by it and esteeming it highly, and it'll work for you. And if you're in a low luster environment, now I, I learned something this week, and every time I, I come at you with another message, I've learned something revelatorily in li through life and some, even some crazy experiences that I can, I can share with you to help you come up to a higher place. The realm of people's opinions and realities and when they're living on a low level is very much overrated. In fact, if you want to succeed, you have to avoid as many things as you embrace. Life, success in life is two things. Avoiding the wrong and embracing the right. Avoiding the wrong as much as you are embracing the right. If you get stuck in the wrong and get caught up all in the cesspool of a, of, of a wrong environment, you can get yourself into things with wrong people and all kind of hell breaks loose. Because why? Because hell is in them. They're in hell. They didn't get to the physical place called hell yet. But they're already, uh, you know, living in that arena. And then everything about them is a mess. Now, relationships is important. Who you embrace as a friend is important. Don't think everyone's your friend. A true friend is someone that could be there when you have nothing to give, you know, and they're still your friend. Why? Because there's, some, there's something deeper in the realm of cosmic, cosmic meaning the out there, you know, the, the, the realm of the world and the way things operate in creation. There's something that ticks between the two of you or the three of you or the 20 of you or the thousand of you, or however many people there are, that just flows that's beyond like what's superficial and on the surface. And then a true friend. Lester Sumrall, the great apostle, said this, and I had the privilege of spending time with him in many cities. And I sat on his private jet, which he affectionately called Angel Four, and the pilot sat me in his seat. Now, if he was there, you know, he's a rough guy. He's a busy guy. He's, a, he's intense. Like, he, if he gets on his jet and sits in his seat, he's expecting the pilots to rev the engines and take off and get him to the next place. He's not going to sit around. So had he been there, I wouldn't have had the opportunity. But because he was on his way and I got there first, the pilot said, let, him, let us show you the plane. They were so happy. They had such a beautiful spirit. No wonder they were flying with Lester Sumrall. He said this. He said, my pilots are not prima donnas that just sit around to work, wait till they fly and get paid a lot of money. He says, they're going to serve in the ministry. And if they don't work my book table and sell a lot of books and represent the ministry, they can't fly me. Could you imagine that? His pilots were servants. And these guys had the most beautiful spirit. They showed me the thing. They were so happy, so full of joy. And they said, this is Dr. Summerall's seat. Would you like to sit there? I was like, Jesus, would I? Are you kidding you don't have to ask me that. I sat down so fast and I was just like this. I think something happened. I, I really do. I, 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 something happened. I feel it right now. I'm talking about it. Oh, my. Did, I didn't have this in my mind. This just came up by the Holy Ghost. And I, I feel it now. I feel it now. Now, he, now Lester Sumrall has been dead since April of 1996. And that's a few minutes ago, Yes. 2006, 2016, plus eight. Whoo! Is it almost 20, 27 years ago he went to heaven? And he got to live in the generation where he didn't see a lot of the nonsense going on in our world. But, you know, he prophesied and predicted decades ago this kind of nonsense that's going on in the world. He really did. I have his tapes and, uh, and books he wrote about how debauchery and horrific sin and perversion and all kinds of communism and antichrist and operations would happen in the world. And they're happening now. But what a great apostle. He carries so much authority. So thank God I had that opportunity. But had he been there, he would have already been getting in to close the door. And unless I'm flying somewhere with him, which we hadn't planned, I, you know, I wouldn't have had that moment, a few moments. So uh, he, he said this. He said a powerful statement. He said, in life, 
you only get a few real good friends, true friends, you know, and cherish them because, you know, a lot of people are in relationships for the wrong reasons, you know, different agendas. But true friends, you really only get a few of them. And he also said people go through certain cycles and seasons in their life. He felt it was like about every 10 years, about every 8 to 10 years, you metamorphosize into another kind of flow and you walk in an entirely different season than what you were in the last. I know that's true because the decades I've walked with God, I've seen a, a few years is this and a few years next is something else. And then you, you know, you see how God takes you through into different seasons of things. So, but I, I want to share this today. The common denominator of great through, I mean, breakthrough, breakthrough, okay, am I making a new word? Greatness and breakthrough. I'm thinking about greatness. I'm trying to say breakthrough at the same time. They mix together. Breakthrough. Oh, my Lord. Breakthrough and greatness is to be in an atmosphere of praise. The principle also Jesus taught us in Scripture, in Mark chapter 6, you can take time, I'm not going to turn to it right now, but you can take time to read that. Talks about he, he, he could do there no mighty miracles at uh, Nazareth. They said, is this the carpenter's son? And now he's the miracle worker? Are you kidding me? And their doubt and unbelief chased the whole, grieved the Holy Spirit. And he, the Bible says, he could there do no mighty works except lay his hands on a few sick folks and heal some minor ailments. But then he left their rejection and unbelief and mockery and wrong attitude and all that and went down to Capernaum. And then there the multitudes thronged him and miracles happened like you've never seen. Blind eyes opened, lepers were healed, cripples walked, deaf ear, people that were demonized, they, 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 got, they went free. All kinds of miracles happened. Why? Because of the atmosphere of celebration. So we celebrate God, and I'm going to get into it in, in Psalm 147, 148, 149, and 150. I'm going to read a few verses from that because I really want to bring this uh, to us from, 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 from the scriptures. And I want to read some principles from my book on praise also uh, in a minute. But I want to say this. Jesus couldn't stay where he was merely tolerated. He had to go where he was celebrated. I had some very interesting things happen yesterday, and God, God is so good. Lord, I have to thank you for it. It happened internationally, and I'm glad for it. I'll take it anywhere it comes from. I don't care if it's on the local front or the international front. Uh, and I want to say this. You have to live in a realm of where there's respect and honor. And the Lord is, is really into showing us that because if you don't, if you don't, uh, celebration, praise, respect, people acknowledging your, your uniqueness and your gifting and your grace, it's important. Even children, when they're growing up, let me tell you what's a really screwy thing. And I, and I really feel bad about this. I tell you, I feel bad. I could cry when I think about it. It's very sad. People that had a rough upbringing, you know, now they can overcome and go into the realms of breakthrough and live a good life because they chose to be a, a, a warrior and to persevere through every kind of nonsense that goes on and they make it anyway. Sometimes those are also some of the best people, but there's something that there's something that uh, happens with a person who had a very good family life growing up. There's, there's different kinds of people. There's people that never exhibit any emotion or affection, and I think that has a lot to do with how they, how they, how they came up, the environment they came from. And then there's people that like are very praiseworthy about everything. I used to look at that and go, my God, do, do people have to do that? You know? Yeah, yeah, there was this TV show one time, this TV series, and I don't know what it was. This guy, I saw this thing. I can't remember where, where, where I saw it. 
And this guy was like, he was on a quest to always be like entertaining his wife and his family and people and going out of his way. And I thought, I looked at it and I went, huh, do you have to do all that? It's like he was going over the top to do that. I was like, can't, <laughs> I made a sarcastic comment. I thought, can't people just be happy wherever they are and just do whatever they're doing? This guy was like always trying to put on some kind of production about everything. Do you know what? I've come to realize that that's really a good thing. <laughs> always giving praise, always giving affirmation. It really, it really means something. Why? Because it helps the self-esteem of the person. Self-esteem in a person can be, can be damaged and diminished when they're not understood, they're not valued, they're not celebrated, they're not lauded and applauded. Just like we praise God and it, breaks, it brings miracles. You know the old saying in church, when the, blessing, when the praise goes up, the blessings come down. It's really true. And we need to thank God. And then some people got into the realm of this revelation of thankfulness, which, took, which takes time to get. If you didn't really have the, 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 the understanding of the realm of thankfulness, thanksgiving and thankfulness, uh, it's, it's, it's a miracle, it's a blessing when, you get the, when, you, when the revelation can come to you. And I see great men that do that, even great men in ministry. Some will have a, a theme for a whole month in their ministry. This is Thanksgiving month. I'm like, yeah, ooh, good. Teach me about that. I heard one of my, uh, one of my old mentors, a very old man now, oh, he's getting on in years, and he got into that after a while, some time, and he just really, I looked at him and I thought, hmm, I'm just listening, you know? But then I began to realize the importance of it. Let's lift our hands right now and thank God. First of all, thank God, but thank everything else. Be thankful for everything else. Appreciate everything. And you know, we have to resign. I wanted to say this for the last 10 minutes. We have to resign from the realm of mediocrity and low-level relationships. People, I want to tell you something that's going to help you. If people don't appreciate you, resign from them. I mean, get up with your, with your, with your awesome self and take a hike and find a different environment. Sometimes it's a whole system, a whole culture. Like in the church world. I don't want to get all into that right now. Because some things you, you, you experience and you want to get over them, you know. And, that, and I want to tell you, that's what's happened to me the last few days. I, I, I'm getting more revelation about this. About the missing ingredient for breakthrough. Because breakthrough comes on the wings of praise. It flies. It moves. It becomes a reality. When there's praise. Even Philippians 4, 8. 6 to 8, I think. 6, six to 8. 8, I think. Philippians 4, read it there. Read 6, 7, and 8, 9. Read those few verses. It says, If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So you have to look at everybody in every situation and say, well, what, what can I see that's good in this? And try to accentuate the positive. Now, if there's too much negative, you take, take, a, take a mathematical you know, a, a look at everything. If there's too much negative and it doesn't end up positive enough, resign. Resign. Just say, I'm out. I'm out. You know, you ever watch the Shark Tank? And they say, I don't like this opportunity. It's too much for me. It's, I don't see myself in this uh, equation. So I'm out. That's the way they say it. I saw a clip on that again yesterday. You know. One kid made this thing called slime. You, you play with it, you know, with your hands. And, you know, people are into that. He made all these different colors and flavors. They call it flavors or what. It's insane. And one lady, she says, I don't, I'm not into the slime, so I'm out. You know, 
I don't see myself wanting to market this product, although I applaud you for where you got. This kid was 17 years old, and he's already, he's already like almost a millionaire. He's a millionaire already at 17 from creating this thing. And people order it. It's a craze. And um, someone says, I, I don't see myself in this. I can't, I can't see myself in this. So I'm out. Another thing is, you have to love what you do. Someone was asking some advice about uh, the musical world, like the rock musicians and all that. I was watching a documentary on that, uh, a few of them last night. And I just stumble on these things. They just pop up in feeds and whatever in the chains of videos. And you just thought, wow, look at that. Yeah, and then another one. Then is it a related one? And you look at that. And this thing came up, and, and this, guy, this guy who's a famous musician, very successful, but he had to work hard and persevere through a lot of things. And, he, and they said, what's the secret of getting to where you've gotten to or, or to be great in this industry, this business? He says, you have to love it because it's going to be a lot of garbage that's going to come through your way with all kinds of evil people, situations, whatever, stress, you know, subversions, adversities, that you got to make sure you love this thing that you want to press through. And it's like that with our walk with God. It's like that with anything you're going to do in business. It's like that in anything in a relationship. What's the, in relationships, getting back to that for a minute, what's the ultimate benefit of a relationship? Is it going to lead to something great? If so, then you need to sign up for that and be in that and persevere through whatever because you're going to get to that place of destiny that's going to be bliss and glorious. Porantala shanda Thank you, Holy Ghost, for the utterance. You're going to see something ahead that's so glorious that you'll fight for it. If not, you want to quit. And I never saw so many, so many people in the world that just quit, even quit on God, quit on ministry over the last few years, you know, with that whole mess that went on in the world, across the world, to shut every, everything down, to try to. A lot of people quit. They quit. They absolutely quit. And I had to repent and apologize myself, I'll tell you straight up, for, for, for having some less activity than I should have had or could have had, maybe if I pushed myself. But sometimes you, you can't see your way out. It, everything around you is closed. Everybody is shut down. Everybody's away. Everything is diminished. Nobody, you, you like, how... How do I get the realm of cooperation? So you kind of, kind of got to flow with what's happening to a degree, but, that, but that's also sinful. sinful. Sin means to miss the mark. There's a mark I was shooting at that I, I kind of got off, I got my, my aim got off a little bit because of all the external things going on. But did I quit on God? You know what I, no, absolutely not. You know what I used to do? Now, I wish I could have done more. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm feeling at. Because you feel like you've lost time, you know. And we all have. In one way or another. I used to do live broadcasts every single day during that time. There was a cafe that had beautiful decor, lighting, the way that the setup was. It really is beautiful. And I did literally hundreds of video messages. And last count, I think we are at about 1,500 live of these that I've done. 1,500. Now, that, that's not preaching, you know, that I did all over the world. In England, when I was there, I estimated that I spoke in at least 200 churches in and around the city of London, once or twice up in the north, Manchester, oh my God, Heesh. and then uh, Milton Keynes and Coventry and uh, oh yeah, yeah, down by the Thames there. What is that place called? It's not Surrey, another one. I can't remember now. Kingston on Thames, whatever, and um, uh, Birmingham. Yeesh, what a what a what a sad, sorry place. I preached in this place as the saddest looking people I ever saw in all my life, in Birmingham. The West Indian, West Indians in Birmingham. 
I had a photograph of them. They all look sad. I mean, sad, impoverished, oppressed. It was rough. I did a pastor's meeting in Nairobi, Kenya, and I saw this. Uh, these people came. They're all wrapped up. These are pastors, you know. The, the weather was cold or whatever. It was in the month of August. And uh, they're all wrapped up. Things wrapped around them. They look like refugees, man. They look like... <laughs> they look they looked like they had a very bad life, you know. They crawled out from some place, and, and then I thought, you should unravel yourself and try to put on, you know, a decent shirt or something, and at least try to notify your face that you're a little bit happy, you know, because we never know. These are reverends. It's called, quote-unquote, reverends, yeah. So I prophesied to a few of them. Of course, when they gave me the microphone, it's over. I mean, the power of God hit the place. In fact, I was going to walk out several times. I was going to leave, and I wired myself up with my microphone system and all that, and I was sitting up in the back. I wouldn't go sit in the front, and they were looking at me like scared, you know, like the prophet, he went and sit in the back. I've done that several times. I said, I don't need to come sit in the front row. I'm sitting in the back, and then, then they call me. I was like, oh, my God. So I was like, really? I said, okay, give me a minute. I had, I had already packed all my stuff, and I was, I, was, I was trying to do this, to get up off the chair, and I was stuck to the chair. Like every time I tried to get up, I couldn't, I couldn't get up. It's like I'm trying to get up and something's pushing me back in the seat. Evidently God had something to do, but I wasn't really, uh, I was looking at the environment, you know, I was like, oh, this is horrible. What a horrible looking bunch of folks and what a sad looking place and oh yeah, yeah. So they said, the great man of God is here, the great prophet of God. I was like, oh my Lord. They're going to call me now? I was just about to leave. And uh, I said, okay. And I just went like this. So I put my microphone thing back together, grabbed my bag, walked to the front. And the second I got up there and started to open my mouth to speak, the presence of God fell whoosh, across the place. It was astounding. I, I, I'm always amazed. I, I, I've never, you know, I never take that for granted. I never, I never feel like that's just like, uh, you know, common. To me, it's an amazing thing every time. I'm just amazed. I, I God started to touch these people. So I wonder the environment that they came from, living in an impoverished state, all wrapped up looking like that, not looking dignified, not looking like royalty. Why? Because the environment did that to them because it's not enough praise. So I found this and discovered this. In, now, when you get revelation of something, that's when you get free. Breakthrough comes on the wings of praise. Breakthrough comes on the wings of revelation. When you see what it is, you go, ah, I'm not going to stay in that now. I'm higher than that. I'm above that. As bad as it is, at, is as what I'm looking at and seeing and understanding and how how degrading it is, how horrible it is, I am going to get out of it and have my breakthrough. So, yesterday was Saturday. Friday was a very rough day because I had a meeting with some of these local people. And I was disturbed. Very disturbed. Not in a good mood. In fact, I said some things that were probably pretty, you know, sharp, vicious to say the least. And I didn't care. I was like, huh? And I looked at some of these people and I'm like, hmm. Why? Because, because of the devastation of the experience. So, the minute I got back to my secret place, from there, instantly, within a minute or two, I started to feel good. I started to feel some peace and some joy and some happiness. I was like, oh. And then, that was Friday. Now, Saturday, I can't explain it. I just had a, a greater perspective on things the whole day and night. You know, 
I talked to a friend in America at four o'clock in the morning. And he said, what time is it there? Is it like two? Oh my God, you're up late, yeah? I said, no, it's four, it's 4.02 a.m. He started to laugh. He said, oh my God. I said, yeah. I'm like awake, I'm like, awake in a zone of glory. I'm just meditating, I'm, I'm studying, I'm looking at things, I'm praying. Uh, I do this all the time. And I was like, wow. I felt, and I can't explain the feeling I had. I felt so good, I felt so. So what had I just come from? I did a broadcast and you'll see the teaching. And uh, the title of it and the theme of it was about money, receiving money, receiving more money and getting out of debt. And I gave some principles again about success in life and how to carry on and the perspective about how God wants us to think, live, be, act, what he wants us to focus on, what he wants us to do, be and have and what he wants us to have and how he wants us to be in a good state. God has never intended for us to be in any realm of lack or mishap or degradation or devastation or despair or lack of something in any way. Be it, that comes from the wrong environment, a lack of praise in the environment. You can't praise God enough, and a lot, and then see the realm of his answers coming. And many times by, <laughs> by his mercy, <laughs> I want to read this now. I got to do it right now. Wait, just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it's, just, it's just the next thought. And I saw it here. Lord, help me find it again. Yes. Psalm 147, verse 11. Let's look at it. The Lord takes, and there's a lot before it, but let me not get all into that. Well, seventh verse is sing, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. <laughs> do it. It'll help you. It'll help everything. Help everything in life. Verse 4, no, 46 verse 8, sorry. 146 verse 8. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind and raises those that are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. There's another judgment scripture. Let's put that in the book I'm writing on uh, blessings for the righteous and judgment on the wicked. And I'm trying to make a book out of that. Now, and I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. We'll, we'll get it done. We'll get it done. Somehow we'll get it done. Psalm 146, 8 and 9. Psalm 146, verse 8 and 9. He relieves the person in need, but to the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. He turns the wicked upside down. Let's go over to Psalm 147, verse 11. The Lord, and there's a lot before that. Let me get right to it. The Lord takes pleasure, watch this now, in those who fear him. You know, I've looked at myself over all the years that I've walked with God. I fear him all the time. I always have this realm of like extra special reverence for him. It just works inside of my soul and spirit. It's there all the time. I've never lost it. I've always had it from day one. I never can lose it. And then I see people that just carry on with all kinds of nonsense and evil and things they do. They don't fear him at all. So they'll get turned upside down like Psalm 146 verse 9 said. No, the second part, the last part of the verse. Psalm 146, verse 9, A, B, and C, the C part of the verse, the way of the wicked he turns upside down. He'll turn the wicked upside down. Say amen. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. Psalm 147, verse 11. In those who hope in his mercy, some things really come <laughs> by God's mercy. That's the way they, that's the way they happen. Then the next verse says, praise the Lord. Praise your God. He's strengthening, strengthening everything for you. And verse 15. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. There's the speed factor again.
I have to make an announcement. We're going to do some prophetic broadcasts coming up, and I really have a friend who's going to help me with that uh, because in all the years, I just, I'm a teacher. I am in the office of a teacher. I'm always going to teach. I'm teaching now. This is so powerful. And I'm not going to get, like in this broadcast, I'm not going to start shouting like, now I'm going to prophesy, you know, get ready. What's your name? But guess what? There's a part of me that I, I haven't accentuated enough in, in days lately. I think uh, in, in earlier times I had done it a lot more. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna bring it back, and I'm gonna get into the realm of the prophetic. Now, in those broadcasts, I will not teach, but only a few moments, and probably just the realm of letting people understand how they need to take action on something and be ready to receive and build their faith and talk about things like that. But a teaching like this is for another set, another setting. So I'm doing that now. So I'm not like gonna get into the realm of the prophetic, where I'm just you know. Just prophesying, but man, I, 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 I tell you, we, we, we need to have it. Now, now here's, because it's so needed by the people, and they want it, they need it, they love it, they, want, they know they need it, and they, they respond well to it. And uh, it's going to happen all over the world. We're going to do a global, begin global broadcast, where we're just going to be prophesying the people. And uh, so his word ones runs very swiftly, verse 15, Psalm 147, 15. To, to put everything together, there's a lot of things he describes here. I'm not going to say all what they are. You can read it yourself. He sends out his word and causes things to happen. His wind to blow and the waters to flow by his word. So I want to bring this into the realm of uh, understanding of the realm of praise and, and celebration and all that. Um, how much do people honor God's word? How much do people honor the realm of his word coming forth? How much do they? Many people forgot about it. The realm of belief and faith in the word is paramount because that's what will produce everything. Who's the man who's called the richest minister in America is where it's like he's like a billionaire, a US dollar billionaire, just about personally, but in his assets of the ministry and all that, it's way beyond that. Uh, he mentioned one time some numbers, and they're in the billion flow. They're in the billion, they have passed the billion dollar flow. But you know what, the whole, the whole precipice and foundation and central theme of his ministry is the word of God and the word of faith. You know. That's, that's what they emphasize, and that's what works. Jesus did, didn't tell the devil what he thought about the, the stupid devil. He just said, it is written. It was written. This is the scripture. This is the law. And now you're gonna, this is going to affect you and you're going to abide by it whether you like it or not. It's reality. It's settled forever in heaven and earth by, by God because he spoke it. He said it is written and the devil had no choice but to do what? To run away. How much are you celebrating the word? How much are you praising the word of God? You can, someone said, can I praise the word? You're an idiot if you don't. And I'll prove it to you scripturally. John 1.1 1, 1 said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God said in another place, the scripture said, that he puts his Word even above his own name. The authority of his name, he put it as secondary to the power of his Word. Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he first reveal his secrets, which is his mind, his con concepts, the things he wants to do, plans of action that he has. To, he reveals his secrets to his servant, the prophet, and the prophet begins to speak and he, begin, he begins to create. Isaiah 40, comfort my people, speak to Jerusalem, speak and say their warfare has ended. The prophet spoke and it just caused something to shift and change. And God said, I'll do nothing unless I first reveal it to the prophet. And the prophet begins to speak. 
the power of the word. Can we celebrate that? Can we celebrate good, positive atmosphere? Can we resign from the wrong ones? You have some bad experiences. You hit yourself against the wall. You, you, you have this, you know, issues with uh, things that try to bite you and cause you to be afflicted with pain and, and, and affect, affected and hurt by things. Why? Because you got into the wrong environment. You have to always look at people to engage them and watch for the signs. Oh, if I could tell you as a man who's not anymore 18 years old, but I'm someone who's a few minutes beyond that young, I can tell you this. Look for the signs. When you see a sign, don't overlook it. When you want to check something out, don't neglect it. When something doesn't seem right, but you overlook it because you, you have a picture and a concept of something that, uh, you know, it should turn out this way, or you hope that it will, look at the signs and, and, and adjust yourself early. I'll give you that counsel. A young preacher, uh, wrote, a preacher wrote me from Tanzania yesterday. I don't know how he heard about me. I'm getting all these messages and I asked him, have we met or online? They said, no, by the grace of God, I was giving you a number. I, I was looking for you. My father even told me he's followed your prophecies for years. He's so happy we got to connect. It's, by, it's a miracle by the grace of God. I got your number and I decided to write you. And I have this new business. I'm buying a hotel. I want you to pray for me. I'm like, wow. And I wrote back, did you... Uh, before he said all the other details about the business and his dad and all that, I said, what a testimony. He never met me. He just heard of me. And then another one came. I don't know how this man found me. And he wrote like, I'm in, I'm, I'm in a career, like I'm, in, I'm in, uh, like in a career, but I feel called to ministry and I'm preaching too. You know, I need some spiritual guidance. I like the terminology. I need some spiritual guidance. You know, I was like, okay, okay, son, here we go. You want, to, want me to tell you what I want to tell you? So I categorized the, the message because I get so many hundreds of messages. I categorized it in a certain file that I have. Then I had a minute and I just thought this. I wrote two statements. I said, Get your financial life settled first. Make money. Be settled financially. And then go preach. Because some of these people in East Africa, they, they said it really is a disease in Kenya and in Tanzania where the churches will just malign you. I had one kid come to me one time. He looked all disheveled and messed up to him. He was in bad shape. And he, he loved my prophecies, you know. He's like, the prophecies you gave. Then I started to make a political statement and I could see him start to turn like into another kind of creature. I was like, oh, I better, I better be quiet on this one. Not to talk about politics. Let me talk about this. Let him think, oh, the great, I'm meeting the great prophet. Okay. So he tells me, I really feel like I need to go out to other countries and I'm really hoping and praying that I get there. I said, I know, because here it's terrible. Yeah, I know. You don't have to tell me. I know how it is here. You run all, all over the country preaching everywhere. I said, how do the pastors treat you? He just shook his head. I said, I know. They'll use you, abuse you, give you nothing. And what does that say for them? What kind of reward is a man going to get in heaven if he abused the anointing? He abused the oxes that tread out the corn. It says, muzzle them not and don't abuse them. Take care of them. Feed them. Honor them. The more you honor, I'm talking about praise, the more you honor and celebrate an anointing, the more it will work for you. The greatest miracles happen when people are celebrating the anointing. Again, scriptural premise, Mark chapter 6, Jesus was, was belittled in his own town and he couldn't do anything there except leave. And he went to Capernaum and there, there the glory hit the place. Why? Because the people were excited. They were celebrating him. They were praising. They were, they were worshiping God. They were thanking God for the gift that came when Jesus walked into the place. The, the Holy Spirit got excited and wanted to heal them all. And he did. And he did. The miraculous is not like a
A mystical thing that you just hope for, it actually happens if you apply the formulation of praise. And honor. Honor is a brilliant thing. When you honor something or someone, God, something, someone, the anointing, wisdom, knowledge, principles, ways of doing things, things just begin to work, and it's not by accident. I saw this actor that I heard heard his name, and I never saw anything with him, and this funny movie came on, and it was cute, you know, I just decided to watch it, you know, and I watched the guy, and his self, his realm of, his level of self-confidence was just paramount, you could just see it, he just carries that. And then you look at how he did business also in the industry, and made so many movies, and He's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, going on like half a billion dollars, when they call the net worth thing, you know. Well, it's obvious. People that become successful, they actually believe that they're supposed to, number one. And they cultivate this thing of faith and belief that they're going to get to that. They're going to get there. And then things begin to happen. All your life, you're not supposed to struggle. I was preaching in North Carolina. We had a great visitation of God hit the place. And some of these guys in the ghetto down there in this one town, uh, very funny. I love this guy. He helped me with my uh, uh, transporting some things from New York to, to there. And he went to get one of, my, one of my workers, one of my staff in New York, and bring them down to the revival, who I needed there to work with me. And, and, uh, and they said... They say that T's like a K, you know. <laughs> they say like it's struggle, they go struggle. They go, you know, like string beans, they call it string beans, you know. Strawberry, they call it strawberry. You know? <laughs> and I said, hey, I, I can't remember his name now. What a, what a beautiful guy. He got saved in a revival. Really got touched by God. And I said, how was it, you know? He said, was it okay? He goes, no, prophet, it was really a struggle. Struggle. I was like, <laughs> I never forgot. I never forgot him for that. It was a struggle. It was a struggle. Struggling, struggling. It's not supposed to be the end of the, the, the perpetual story in your life, in your world. There's supposed to be metamorphoses of things into great change, but... I'm giving you the key here, and some of you, many of you, I, I hope, will catch this, that it's in the realm of praise. Praise to God, praise to you. See, people are afraid of that. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, praise the, you know, you know, these people that talk things like, oh, it's not about me, hide me behind the cross, I don't need to be seen. I'm like, you know, most of those people really don't go far. There's something that works in a counteractive way of their, of their progress and their success. Because if you're the one that God ordained to do something, you have to be seen. The seer is not always the prophet, but the prophet is always the seer. Why? Because but the, but the prophet is the one with the microphone. He's the mouthpiece that has to speak for God. So you want to say like, I don't want anybody to see me. What do you think you're ugly? You think you're not attractive? I don't want anybody to hear me. It's not about me. You know, what is all that about? What is all that about? It's not about you, it's about him. That's obvious, first of all. That's a premise that we already know. But now you, as the package that carries the ingredients of what God gave, has to be presented to the world. And the better you present it, and, and the more honor and glory and organization and excellence there is in it, it, it denotes the success that you'll have, or not have if you don't do it correctly. What do we call marketing? Are you getting blessed? This is deep, yeah? My God. Marketing, exhibition. <laughs> You're supposed to do it in a low way? You know what I know? And I'm about to do it. I'm about to do it in big ways. Oh, yes. I'm doing things you don't, I'm not talking about. I'm not talked about. I'm talking about with certain people, but nobody knows. We're about to do things that are just astounding. 
the more you build a system of excellence with great, I don't want to use the word presentation because someone could just try to read into that. It's just about, oh, how you present it. All. But the whole, the whole system of operation is, is glorious and excellent. The more you do that, the more success it will breed in and of itself. You can go to a low place and liven them up to a high level. Not that they're going to catch it and do what you do, but you can get the result that you want. Now, yesterday, I started to allude to it. Maybe I shouldn't even tell the detail. But I, I talked to some certain people, uh, dear, dear friends that I haven't spoken to in a while, which I regret I'll have to talk with them more. Sometimes you lose touch a little bit with people that are really great and... God brings it up with a very strong purpose, and you're like, I got to talk to them now. And they can actually call you by the Holy Ghost, which one prophet friend of mine called me from Europe, and we talked for an hour, and it was, it was, it was astounding. I mean, what he shared was. And he'd gone through, he's gone through some things himself, but he doesn't, he doesn't look like it. So I look at him, I'm very impressed I want to I want to help present him to more to the world, and he's doing it with me. Because we're 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 valuable. I mean, the the level of grace and glory and power that's in us from heaven is astounding. And I, he didn't look like he was bothered at all with what he was dealing with. I was like, some people would be miserable, they'd be depressed, they'd be mad, they'd be complaining, they'd be, and you're just like sitting there, like you're happy, like you don't have a care in the world. And he told me what was going on, and I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. So we finished the conversation. I had to pray for him. And I began to shout, you know, to declare, because we need him. Let me tell you something. Health. You need to celebrate health. You need to celebrate the realm of being healthy. Some people don't take care of themselves, and they don't. When they're young, they think it, it seems okay, but then when you begin to age more, you know, these things begin to affect you. I could mention some, the names of some, some health practitioners. I, don't, I think I'll skip it right now. Or maybe I should do it while I'm on it, because it might help somebody. If you don't get it and you don't understand what I'm talking about, you're lost. What is that lady's name? I can't remember her name, so I can't say it. But there's another guy. He died at 80 years old, and he would have lived longer, but something's happened. They even think he was killed because of the revelation he had that he was bringing to the world and the, to bring people into health. He's called Doc. And years ago, I, I wasn't really into listening to all these kind of guys, but, you know, when you get to a certain realm of understanding, you want to... His name is Dr. Sebi, S-E-B-I. Dr. Sebi, S-E-B-I. You can find him online. The lady's name is what? If it comes back to me, I think she's from Australia. And her clips are going online a lot right now. You know, Australia has become so uh, uh, communistic, the socialism thing, demon has hit over there. Like, when they're in the lockdown, they lost their minds. They, 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 the whole Australia... And I've been there, it's a beautiful country, but they have lost their, they have lost their minds. The people, whoever's in leadership or whatever. And you know, they had a prime minister some years ago. He's not there anymore. I wish he was. And I don't know if he got compromised a bit along the way. I think I heard that he did. But he was, he was a tongue-talking uh, Christian, a Pentecostal believer. He was the prime minister. But he's not, he's not there anymore. But now it's like they've lost their mind. So this lady uh, has so, so much um, revolutionary stuff for the health. She knows the, all the physio physiology of everything and can tell you how to cure everything and fix everything. The medical industry got so mad they banned her from the country. She had to leave. Can you believe it? That tells you something about her. There was a powerful man of God in the 1800s who was, wanted to run for parliament in Australia and they fought him and he lost the race. And it's like he, he like spoke a curse to the people. 
mess with him and he left the country and went to America and built a great work there. And he said, I'm out of here. Smart guy. This goes in line with what I'm saying. And then this lady was given the testimony. It seemed like the worst thing that happened to her. They shut her business. They canceled her out. A horrible story. It's bad. She left and went to another country. I don't know if she went to Europe or America. I'll find out more. And she, she was thanking God for it. She was thanking God even for that adversity. She said it seemed like they stole her, her, her livelihood. And uh, she, was thanking, she was thankful for it. Why? Because it's opening up a whole new horizon for her somewhere else. Even to reach more people. So what can seem like a setback when you're in a certain environment that's not conducive, resign from it or believe for God to take you to the higher place. Because I'll tell you this, you don't need everybody that you think you need. You don't need everybody to help you. You need the potent divine connections. Even a few of them can catapult you to another dimension of living. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I receive them right now. There's a prophetic word here. I receive them right now. These dull people I've had around, situations that are endlessly disappointing. I can't seem to see my way through. If no one has the answer, they just look at me. I'm talking, but they don't come up with any creative brilliance. They just, they're just there. Father, we love them all. May everybody has their place of operation. Even some people are relatives or family members. So what are you going to do? Change your name or your family and kill them all or kick them in the whatever? No, you can't. But they're there. But they're, we need to believe for the realm of the other ones coming because they're bridges to the next season. I want to prophesy to you and tell you this, that everything you're dreaming for, God has the answer. God is not your problem. He's never our problem. He never was. He wants us to live in superb abundance. Lift your hands again. You put your hands down. Too soon. Receive this. God has the answer, and that answer is coming forth. He's the God of the suddenly. Suddenly the Holy Spirit moved when they were waiting there 10 days, 380 people out of 500 couldn't hang. They even stopped believing he was coming. And 10 days later, the 120 that were diehard, they just were like, well, we can't move. I, you know, we heard the command. We don't understand. Doesn't feel good sitting here in this stone cold place. I was in the upper room in Israel. I know how it is. I preached there. I prophesied there. I led worship there in the upper room. The upper room. In Jerusalem, I was there. I have photographs of it. The power of God moved through the place. The wind of the Spirit blew there again. It's like he's still, he's still moving there. The one place I didn't feel the presence of God was at the garden tomb, and that's the place I thought I'd really feel the presence of God. And then uh, I went into the tomb, and like somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around. There was nobody there. I mean physically, like hard like that. Not like it was the wind blowing or it's one of my, you know, I was feeling this uh, sensation of something. No, it was like boom, 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 like you're knocking on the door. A physical hand. I turned around, there's nobody there. It was an angel. And then I felt this, like the, this, whoever this was, I couldn't see, but I could feel what they, that they were there. It's like their hand pointed at the door. Look at the door. And I turned and I looked. And I read, he is not here. <laughs> For he is risen. You ever see the plaque of the garden tomb and the plaque they put on the door? He is not here. For he is risen. That's what it says. And it's like the Holy Spirit and the angel went like this. You expect to feel. What does it say? Read it again. Duh, he is not here. I'm like, I get, I, I'm, I'm not stupid. Thank you. That settled it. And I didn't want to stay there anymore. I said, if he's not here, I don't want to be here. I'm at, let's go. And they were like, no, we have to go look at the walk through the garden. I said, no, I have enough, enough. I'm going. Where's the vehicle? Let's go. We walked through, you know, the garden around there. I was like, I saw it. You look over the top, you know, the Golgotha's Hill. You look down, there's a bus terminal down on the street below the hill where they crucified the Lord. 
a bus terminal. It's scary. You think, man, they should have put like acres around this and put something around it. But still, I look to the sign on the door. He's not here, so it doesn't matter anyway. Let them have their bus terminal. The main road is right there. Right below the hill, Golgotha's Hill, the skull. With the look like the, the rock formation, like the eyes, you know. Look like the face of the skull. They call it Golgotha. Right, if you take a few meters, just right in front of you, go down, look down. There's the main road and a bus terminal. There's buses parked there. Traveling on the road. But then we went to the upper room. And the glory hit the place. Why? Because the outpouring of the Spirit is the thing now. Jesus was crucified, rose again, and that was it. And now, we're in the age of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm sending him to you. And he'll remind you of everything that I told you. And he'll lead you and guide you into all truth. He'll be your teacher, your adversary. I mean, your, your, your advocate. Your, your, your advocate. Your helper. Your intercessor, your teacher, your guide, your counselor, your comforter. Oh, God. So what do we need? We need the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you. We, we thank you for this right now. We lift ourselves up in your presence and we thank you, Lord, for the touch of heaven right now. To celebrate your presence brings the miraculous. Celebrate your presence and your glory is what brings us victory. Breakthrough flies and comes on the wings of praise. In my book, I wrote a sub-chapter on praise, and before I get to that, I want to say something else about it, about Jerusalem. They took me to this place called uh, Real Evil, Real Evil Place. Very evil place. Caiaphas' house. Caiaphas was one of the Sanhedrin. Really bad guy. Bad guy. And I want to tell you, there's no street in heaven named after no Caiaphas. In fact, I doubt he's, I would say he's not there. He was wicked. Inside Caiaphas' house, down in the, in the basement level, they have these uh, cells, prison cells, built with bars. They're still there. And I asked the uh, Israeli... Uh, Brilliant, brilliant guy who was our, our, our guide there, taking us around, showing us the sights. And he's the one who chose me by the Spirit of God. This is not a Christian. He doesn't confess to be a, profess to be a Christian. He said he's a Jew. And, uh, but he knows more about the Bible than most Christians. He knows the whole in and ins and outs of all of it. He looked at me and his eyes lit up and he said, well, I want to uh, elect you to be the, uh, like the spokesperson or the, the one who's going to lead the, the, the service in the upper room. You're going to do it. I looked at him and said, yeah, okay. I accept. I have photographs of that somewhere. The, pre the presence of God filled the place. So, but I got some, I learned something else in Caiaphas' house. In Caiaphas' house, downstairs there's these cells. I said, what were those for? Oh, that's where they put the, the, they were persecuting people. They put them there and tortured them and all that. I was like, oh my. And many of them just died there. They were killed there. And when we went outside, more details of that, but another day. When we went out through the hallway to the, a big room, there's a statue of Jesus carved out. And he's like this with his hands forward like this. Like, submitting himself to be a servant, that kind of thing, or to be taken or to be, you know, whatever, just to give himself. And it's like this. And when I went and walked and stood next to the statue and I put my hand on it, I touched it, and, and down at the bottom it said, 
it had a plaque and it had some words under it. I don't remember what it said. But it was entitled, The Servant. The Servant. And I'm telling you, the hand of God fell on me so strong while I was standing there, I didn't think I was going to live. I can't explain it. Like, and by faith, I know I am. I'm just starting the, the, the journey of ministry around the world. This was where God had me birth the ministry. That's where I founded the ministry, was in Jerusalem, Israel. And that's the first place I was. And then the whole world opened to me after that. So obviously, <laughs> I wasn't going to leave at the... I wasn't done. I was, just, I was just at the beginning place of the international ministry. Now, I've been preaching in America, but, you know, when God took me to the nations, we, we birthed the international ministry in Jerusalem. And I, and I need to... Uh, can I tell you something? Lord, oh, this is too amazing. In fact, in actual fact, what's today's date? Yeah. The, the time I was there was this week, today. The first week of the month, of this month. That's when I was in Israel. Why is the Holy Ghost having me get into this? This is an anniversary. And I just saw an angel standing right here, right now, right here. Let's lift our hands and praise God. God is, God is here. This is amazing. I have an ordination thing signed by the Lester Sumrall. I don't know where that is. It's in my archives in America. I have to get that again. Dated February, February 6, the, the, the date, the year we were there. February 6. I just found the pictures. I was standing at the Sea of Galilee with Dr. Mike Murdoch. We were standing there together. <clears throat> and at one of Peter's boats, a boat that Peter used to fish, is there. We stood in front of it, Dr. Mike Murdoch and myself. Just us two. Dr. Sumrall had signed the... Uh, and he had just departed. He had just, he had just uh, left the earth before that. So he didn't make that trip. Why? Because he was in heaven. <laughs> he couldn't come. Too bad. If I had done the one the year before, the year before that he went, that we would have been with him. But his son was there and he represented the whole thing very well. Stephen. Oh my God. That was this week. It was actually today was the day I was there. This is a celebration. Father, thank you. I want to, I want to declare prophetically a reset for people. I do it for myself right now of ministry. Back to the origin, back to the original place. We've seen some great days. We've seen some glorious days. We've seen some rough and tough days. I want to just give that all back to you right now. Right here, right now, this afternoon. I want to give that to you right now. I want to take it from out of me and give it all to you right now as a sacrifice, as a realm of thanksgiving for all you did and even your grace that helped us persevere for all the horrific things we've gone through and warfare and adversity and whatever. I want to take it all right now and give it to you and start again. Right now. Holy Ghost, touch people on the other side of this camera. There's people that need this right now. The, the power of God is coming on people. You're going to begin to weep. You're going to be in the feel the touch of heaven right now. Receive it right now. Let a new beginning start from today. And what we're about to do, even this week, is going to come to pass. Before the end of this coming week happens, I'm telling you some things will have transpired. I'm not saying that mystically, mythically, by faith, and hope so, wishing so. No, I'm telling you, tangibly, I have things in motion that are actually happening, that are already scheduled, but more is coming. Even the realm of surprises, because God has to take care of his own elect. God has to take care of his own work. God has to take care of, of us, by his mercy here to those that fear him, Psalm 147, 11. And hope in his mercy, he's going to do it. But for the wicked, he's turning everything upside down, the previous psalm said. Then it goes on to say in Psalm 149 and 150 that our praise 
will steal the avenger and put our foot on their neck and bind their kings with and their nobles with fetters of iron. Our praise is what does it, the praise to God and the realm of praise in the realm of our atmosphere and celebration. Father, we leave everything alone that needs to be left alone. We resign from every connection or issue that has beset us in any way from this hour right now and do we do a reset right now in the Holy Ghost. Your business life, your ministry life, your financial life, things are going to begin to flourish for you because you're getting back to the original plan. Apologize to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry for the time lost. For anywhere I got dissuaded or disillusioned in my mind, like I said last night on the broadcast. Uh, and that'll be, that's being uh, ed, uh, prepared to be re uh, released again tonight. And, uh, but the, the Lord is... The Lord is, uh, is, is saying this again, like David got stirred up. He went into the, into the presence of God and he said, Now, why is my soul disquieted within me? Why am I feeling down? Hope in God. Rise up and bless the Lord, O my soul. Psalm 42. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, what? O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Praise Him on the instruments. Praise Him with the song. Praise Him with the dance. Psalm 149 and 150. Praise, praise, praise. Praise, praise from my book. In the battle, Joshua, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat sent out the praise team first. See 2 Chronicles 20, verses 21 to 25. Judah is the praise tribe. The word Judah means praise. So if you want more victory, send Judah first. Send Judah out in the realm of your interconnectivity and relationships and environments and also first to God. Your praise, point three, your praise will bind <laughs> and execute vengeance upon God's enemies and your enemies. <laughs> Glory to God. The angels of the Lord are here. The presence of God is here. Receive the touch right now. Fire the Holy Ghost come upon you right now. Receive it. Receive it. Praise lets you know who's the boss. It kills pride. You don't think too much of yourself. You know, the scripture says we, we ought not to think more of ourselves than we ought to. But we need to think highly of ourselves because we're somebody. We're not nobodies. That's a fact. It balance, that balances out on both sides. When you acknowledge the Lord and give him glory for everything that he's blessed you with, you can't be proud because he's the one who blessed you with it all. I wrote that. It's right here in my book. If you don't have this book yet, you need to get this book. Prophetic Keys to Successful Living with the foreword written by the illustrious Archbishop Harrison Nanga. Nanga and he uh, wrote three pages in the front about me. The foreword here, look. Page one, page one, page two, page three. About me and the prophetic grace. Let me read something he wrote. Well, I've never... I, I should, I should have done this by now. I don't think I've ever done it. He talked about the prophetic grace. He said, top on the list of the prophetic voices that God has raised in our time is Dr. Thomas Matthew IV. These are the words of Harrison Nanga, the great apostle. And multitudes of you know him and love him, as I do also. Top on the list of the prophetic voices that God has raised in our time is Dr. Thomas Matthew IV, the author of this book that you are about to read here. Courtesy of this book, you will encounter a man with an incredible prophetic anointing. I don't like the word incredible so much. I would change that to awesome or great or credible, credible instead of incredible. But that's a word that people use to describe something that's big, you know, but it's really inaccurate. I remember Morris Cirillo used to say that. It's incredible. I used to say, Morris, Brother Morris. No, it's credible. Incredible means not credible. 
they use it the word wrongly, but we know what they're trying to say. Okay, so we could change that word over, but something else. But this amazing, I'll say amazing prophetic anointing that God has invaded cities and nations of the world with in the last few decades. All the while, he even was looking at my track record of time. You see, the man knows what he's talking about. And he knows, he knows about me. He knows me. And he's been studying me for a long time, even while we weren't walking together in friendship. He was seeing me from observation for many years. Receiving all the things that God has used me to do and speak and release over the nation of Kenya, uh, gloriously, and other places of the world. God has used his servant, Thomas Rand IV, as an articulate prophetic voice during this last hour order in a, in a manner that a carnal mind would hardly even be able to decipher. Closer to home, Dr. Thomas Mantha IV has, with the precision of a skilled warrior, and in diverse and unusually close presidential election, presidential election cycles, dispensed accurate prophetic messages that have gone a long way to, to ease tension across Kenya And empower the church to intercede from a point of knowledge from God. That's, that's, that's amazing, huh? Hence, settling down to read this great book, Prophetic Keys to Successful Living, shall without doubt be memorable and worth your time. Oh, yes. It's an investment in eternity, which you, be, you shall forever be grateful. Thank you for the kind words. Archbishop. In these moments, rare opportunities are being presented to you when you interact with someone here, meaning myself, the prophet, that God has entrusted deep mysteries of, of his kingdom. Duly aligned to dictates of the dictates of wisdom, Dr. Thomas Van der Ford reaches you courtesy of the pages of this book in an elaborate, easy-to-read manner, broken down to explicitly, uh, broken down so explicitly that it's impossible to miss with lessons arranged alphabetically and with prophetic diction, toned down to enhance communication the author goes a long way to ensure you, dear reader, that this makes the most of this great read. Seize your copy, therefore, and ensure those in your circle to each equally tap into this great wisdom and access the mind of God pertaining to your success in life. Get, these book, get these, this book for other people. Granted, God never intended for you to live a mediocre life. Thank you. That's right. These are his words. The Archbishop Harrison Nanga saying this. On the contrary, right from the outset, God has every intention to ensure that you become a sign and a wonder to your generation that is too powerful to be stopped. There's more. That's only one, two paragraphs I've read. There's more yet. But isn't that so powerful? Too powerful to be stopped. I wrote this about myself. I am fully courageous and thereby I am unstoppable. <laughs> That's the thing the devil is scared of in people, that you're unstoppable. You can't be stopped. Someone that's unstoppable, like you made up the decision, you made the decision, I will never quit. Lester Sumrall, the great apostle, who's been in heaven now, 96, 2006, 2016, plus four, that's 24, plus three, that's 27. He's been in heaven for 27 years. Can you even believe that? My Jesus. He, he said this. He said he, he, he got this revelation when he was young. He was going through some very hard times, as every anointed preacher will, because the devil, the devil will just like more or less see to it that you have trouble. Yeah? But Jesus said what? Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. In this world, John 16, 33, in this world you have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That's what he said, yeah? So he, he, he made a decision. He said, I will not quit. 
He went to the Lord and said, should I quit now? You want to take me now? This is too much. These people, these situations. I know, I could say that myself. These people, these situations, what am I going to do? Give up? Am I going to let their evil and folly kill me? To hell with that and to hell with whoever wants to get in the way of the devil and be his friend. Bye-bye to you. Hello to glory and grace. Lift your hands right now. Bye-bye to the devil and his ugly friends and evil. And hello to glory and grace. It's a new season from today, February 4th, 2024. This is the very week I was being visited by Jesus himself and the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem, Israel, where we founded the ministry. I walked into the Jordan River and came out and they took a photograph and my hair was coming down, my beard, and I had this tight white thing on, like the white robe, you know, and it just gave this thing and people said, man, it looks like Jesus coming out of the water all over again. That's how I look. I was like, this is, this is phenomenal. Father, turn the clock back, do a reset. All the trouble we've seen, that like that old song, Ain't Nobody Knows the Trouble I've Seen. But the other song says, Can't Nobody Do Me Like Jesus. Can't Nobody Do Me Like the Lord. Ain't Nobody No. Climbing up the rough side of the mountain, the old, the old, <laughs> the old song. Climbing up the rough side of the mountain. You don't need to sing that because you're focusing on the wrong thing. And there's a great old song called The Old Rugged Cross. There's an anointing on that song. I cry. I, I cry easily when I hear that song. It just does something to me. I don't know. There's, there's a special anointing. But you know, you don't want to focus on that too much. You want to take your mind, eyes off the cross and look at the glory. The Catholic Church has a thing where they have the emaciated Savior with the hole in the side and the trickle of blood coming down, they painted it red. And he's on the cross with the nails through his wrists, you know, and like this looking, you know. And that's Jesus to them. That's, that, that's a wrong representation. You know what? You could put that somewhere and say this was like do before and after. You ever see a before and after picture? Before, after, and show him now. <laughs> he doesn't look like that. He's the king of glory. He's not hanging like that, broken and suffering and wounded. He did that for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, wounded for our transgressions. And by the chastisement, uh, uh, you know, him losing his peace gave us peace. His losing his prosperity and freedom gave us prosperity and freedom. The stripes on his back gave us healing. He did that for us, but he didn't stay there. In fact, the time in the tomb where it says on the door that the angel and the Holy Spirit came and visited me and told me, look and read the sign. It says he is not here. He was only there for two, two days. Friday evening, Saturday evening, Friday night, Saturday all day, Saturday night, and Sunday he got up and walked out in a resurrected body. The angel came to roll the stone away. No man, once they pushed that thing with many soldiers and then they had guards there, you couldn't move that thing. It was impossible. You would need an, half a battalion of men of many dozens, I don't know how many, to push that thing. It was so heavy. The angel just came and went. It opened and out he came. Ha <laughs> ha. So how is it now? You know? Victory and breakthrough. Let's lift our hands. I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm getting crock. I'm getting. I'm getting. I'm getting. I'm getting. I'm getting messed up here. I'm getting drunk in the Holy Ghost right now. Shandalaba kela satarabosha. The victory is ours. The breakthrough is ours. That's not just an ethereal statement like I wish and I hope for it, but it's a reality. When we do what? When we reset everything and clear ourselves out of everything bad, even the good things. Give it back to God, you know. You'll have the good memories. You won't forget them. Don't worry. You're not losing them by saying, Lord, I give this to you as a sacrifice. You're not absolving yourself from them and taking them away from you. But you've got to get rid of the evil things. All bitterness, everything that causes us to have pain, any realm 
Hey, Lord, put a searchlight on us right now, right here. A, a torch of the fire of God from the altar. That anything that's affecting us in any adverse way, by things that have been done to us in a bad way, by bad people, free us from it right now. We forgive them. We release them. They have no place in us. We're not going to walk around all pissed off. Excuse if I said that. You know, PO'd. You know what I mean? Annoyed, irritated, upset. Why? Sad. Why? Because of evildoers? The psalm said what? 146 verse... Uh, Nine. Let me look at it again. He said, <laughs> man, I love this. To the righteous, he watches over them. And he raises those that are bowed over. Any kind of affliction that you had. Psalm 146, verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 8. Psalm 146, 8. The Lord watches over you to take care of you. But the ninth verse, he went on to say, but to the wicked, he turns them upside down. That's how it is. Remember the, the, the Lord chastised David and said, don't fret yourself because of evildoers, evildoers who seem, that he, they, they even seem to prosper in their way. Don't worry about them. Because he said next, for the wicked shall soon be cut off and cut down. You see how I'm a teacher? You see how I'm, this is apostolic, this is prophetic, this is, this is pastoral, this is teaching. If I, if I were not to do this and just have a show and like, come on and, you know, let me tell you the name of your, your street address and your, you see what I mean? You see what I mean? Would you learn all this? I glory in this anointing. I mean, this is rare. And, and this is, these are all the things I'm sharing with you right now you won't hear in a Sunday service. Let me tell you the benefit of praise is to invoke the presence of God, not just a cultural song and a dance and to get yourself... A lot of people get themselves hyped up into emotional, an emotional state, a cultural state, a ritual way of doing things. You know, that's the way we do. And they never access the presence of God. That's where people miss it in the church. Praise and worship <clears throat> is to bring you into the realm of the presence of God. I was praying for a couple of hours earlier before I came out here and I was I was in worship and I was just listening to the best songs that trigger unlock the anointing and God showed up and he walked in my 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 place there and said breakthrough comes on the wings of praise I heard that statement today from the Lord right here a couple of hours ago and that's where this came from. The Lord is amazing. And he's going to begin to do new things from today. I, I'm not finished, but I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to wrap it here. And we'll pick this up in the next, uh, the next broadcast, whatever. We'll get on to something else. But the Lord is going to begin to cause surprises. Divine surprises of breakthrough and blessing even from unexpected sources, even things that we would have hoped to see happen but didn't know through who or how or when, they're going to begin to become a regular thing from today. Do you believe I'm God's prophet? Father, right now, I thank you. Right now, as we're about to jump off here, I challenge everybody to sow a seed into this anointing for your own breakthrough. And the ways to do it are in the heading of the title. Of the titles of the messages, you can find the links there on what to, what to click on, how to tithe, to send your tithe, to send your offering, to send your seed for the realm of breakthrough. Do that right now and let God be glorified. If you don't yet have this book, many hundreds of people have it, but you, many don't. And these, uh, I did a first printing of these and we printed thousands of these and they're all gone. They're all over the world. And then this was a revised edition, of course, then... Uh, uh, added with the forward with our beloved Archbishop Harrison Nanga and some photos uh, in the middle 
which I want to do in future in color. I didn't like that the printer cheaped his way out on this and didn't want to spend the money for the ink. You know, I don't like that. These need to be in color. So I'm going to digitally print, like, I have three new books coming out in the next few days. I want to show you this too. This is a, an attendance book for our meeting. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that city. I think it's Hong Kong or somewhere. We're not there, but I just like that cityscape, so we use that. And look at the back. Oh, my God. Look at that. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? The prophet in action. Look at that. Isn't that something? These prophecies, many of these prophecies over the nation of Kenya, of Kenya this is a, a few in a document folder I have here. But this is just very few. Uh, are going to be made into another book uh, that people really need to have the reference point of that. I have another book on the Office of the Prophet. We're going to re-release this. I probably won't change this because it's full color. And you see how this is a full color book. Full color, the way the pages. I'm just going to have to print this digitally, uh, as as many as uh, people are asking for, and I'll probably do it uh, on order. And uh, this is a masterpiece. It's got a lot of great stuff in it. I don't think I need to change anything in this. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. An expanded edition of the Laws of Success. The Laws of Success is coming out the next few days. It's, I heard uh, my technician said it's done, and I want to see it. By tomorrow, I want to look at, I want to print a, a proof copy and make sure it's good and ready to go. Others, the focus factor, which I'm going to work on more. Success strategies, I'm going to work on more. So those will be a minute before those are re-released. And this book is, is being re-released now. 66 Prophecies for Kenya in an expanded edition. This will be ready in the next couple of days, a few days, you know logistics, but we're going to be re-releasing this. And as I look through this again, I almost begin to weep because I said, you know, all these things were for the nation, but I see they're also for me. This was a 55-minute visitation from the Lord. And I did this a long, this was done a long time ago. This was several years ago. And I see how every one of the 66 prophecies is for people, but it's also for us in our ministry. And, and by the way, most of this, in fact, all of it in one way or another, all of these have come to pass. And, uh, but they're, they're, they're like breathed by God. A 55-minute visitation turned out to be 66 prophecies, which means I was really quick on the draw. I was really moving quick because in less than one minute I was doing one prophecy to another. If 66 came out of 50, 55, 66 came out of 55 minutes. That means somewhere in less than a minute. And uh, dictated and brilliantly brought out into print. That's coming out, that's coming out again. Okay, and uh, many other things. And this right here is available. Just type book in a text to me by WhatsApp on Messenger or text message on the phone number. Uh, plus 254-706-164191. You can use that to send your seeds and your tithes also by M-Pesa. Plus 2547. Well, in, in Kenya, you don't need the 254. Just 706 Sow that seed today if you're uh, releasing your tithe or your offering or seed. I want you to sow for the realm of breakthrough. And I want God to tune up your world and everything becomes praised, praiseworthy, thankful, honor. You get it? Are you getting this? Are you getting this? Because that unlocks the glory and the best comes out of anything when you're in that kind of environment. When you're with people that have an attitude, you know? I spoke to a guy yesterday and he sounded distracted. I called him back, some business vendor. And then he, he and I said, are you like, you seem like you're distracted or something. You want, can we talk later? He's like, no. And then, he just wanted, and then I asked him to send me something. And then he says, I'm going to send it in a few minutes. And then he didn't do it. He's a liar. I'm not going to work with a liar. So now I don't care about his gift. Cancel it. He lost my business. I'll find somebody else. Because I could feel, you know, you have to look at the signs. I'm telling you from today, let God... Turn up your discernment to feel attitude, wrong attitudes and to see signs of wrong situations. 
if something's too good to be true, it usually is. And if something is like a, a, a rye and a miss in the situation, note that and then try to figure out what's, what's really the real thing. And the sooner you get yourself out of certain things that are not right, you'll save yourself a lot of heartache. Also, I want to pray for God to redeem the time. You know, like uh, Joel chapter 2, 25, somewhere in there, the locusts eat eight seasons, ate away at things, and God said, I'll restore what the locust has eaten. Lift your hands. What the thief has stolen, I'll bring back. For your shame, you'll have double honor. Again, Isaiah 61, verse 7. Verse 4, verse 7. 61, I think it's verse 7. 4 or 7. It talks about rebuilding the ruined waste places. And he said, for your shame, you'll have double. Double, you'll have double for your trouble. Job was humiliated and attacked and messed up, but then he got double for his trouble. Job 42, 10 to the end. Job 42, you can read that. Job chapter 42, verses 10 to 16. Said then he had the most beautiful daughters, another family, double everything he had. I'll tell you one thing. Job had 3,000 camels. Now he has 6,000 camels. Camels in the economy of today in Saudi Arabia are worth in the millions of dollars, which means that Job's 6,000 camels will be worth in the billions, in the billions of dollars. He was a billionaire just in camels. Look at Abraham. Abraham became the friend of God, left the land of lack of celebration, of familiarity. Terah, his father's house, of Ur of Chaldees, the moon worshippers, the idol worshippers. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, God said, get out of there. I say to a lot of you, get out of there. There's some, um, doesn't that mean that you have to leave the country, leave the city. There's just some uh, environments you're in that you're, 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 you're hoping for something that's never going to come because of the nature of the way they are. One calamity is the church world in certain environments. The cultural system. Get out of it. Build your own. Get a strategy. Two things you need now. And I heard a great uh, man who's nearly a billionaire, very successful in what he does in America. He said he figured out the number one thing he needed. People asked him, what's the number one key to success? What he said was astounding. And it pro if you think of a word, it, you, probably, you probably wouldn't guess right. Okay, I'm gonna, but I'm going to tell you the secret. I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, I figured out what I need most is, are you ready? Some of you need to write a check for $1,000 or send a seed for $1,000. Some of you need to give, you need to sow a seed of 100,000 shillings for this key, because that's how much it's worth. I'm not selling anything. I'm kind of saying it in a, in a joking way, but seriously. Also, invest in this anointing. If you, you don't cherish this grace, I, I don't understand, you know, how you can do that and dishonor God on that level. And some people, it's the way they are. They dishonor everything. They dishonor even themselves. It's sad. They dishonor other people in their environments. Everybody there hook and crook to steal and to abuse and to give nothing and to choke and to choke the life out of them and stress people out and frustrate them. As I said prophetically, resign from all of that. And the two things you need, number one is this. He said the number one thing I, I decided, figured out that I needed was energy. E-N-E-R-G-Y. If you have energy for something, I said this, somebody else said, uh, this great rock musician said, said How, what's the key to success? Loving what you're doing because you're going to persevere. But if you love it enough, you love the music, you love the song that you write, you love the thing that your instrument you're playing, you love the genre, the arena you're in, you love it so much, you'll persevere and succeed. Which also goes back to having energy and passion. You have, those, you have those two things, energy and passion. You can create anything. Father, I, I declare prophetically, I see this in the spirit and the vision right now. I, I see high-level people get, getting a hold of this message. I see influencers, great people, tapping into the grace of this teaching and going through it and going, wow, I'm getting something from this. Father, release it to them in Jesus' name. Let, it, let, let them find it. Let, it. let it find them and let them find it. However it happens in Jesus' name, so be it. Energy. And then passion. And you need a strategy. The strategy of what to do now to make this 
glory and thing that's in me from God work. This gift that I have, this talent that I have, this plan of action that I have to make it work. Father, in Jesus' name, it's going to happen. Sow a seed into that and watch God begin to unfold it. And as I hear from you, you become a partner of the ministry. I, I'll be praying for you. I'm Thomas Marathon IV. I love you much. We'll talk to you on the next one. Be blessed, my friends. Have a great day. Share this with everybody. And I'll be right back to talk to you again in the next broadcast. Type book, get a message to me on how you can get this. And make sure you're tithing, giving, sowing seed into this anointing for the purpose of your breakthrough. For breakthrough flies and travels and comes on the wings of praise. I hope you got that. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear brethren, in Psalms 119, 105, the Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Truly, God has sent prophet Dr. Thomas Manton IV to proclaim and declare his word of abundance and prosperity prophetically unto the nations. Thus, brothers and sisters in Christ, I urge you, just as the Bible says in Matthew 10, 41, whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet reward. Let us welcome and embrace the prophet of God by supporting his ministry. You can sow a seed, you can send your love offering, you can support or partner in the ministry program using the details displayed on your screen. For when the prophet of God decrees a blessing upon you, indeed, you shall be blessed.